Good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are in the world. Welcome to today's webinar, where we're joined by Fox Entertainment Group, who will be sharing an approach to developing their new GTLD strategy, including some key best practices, timely discussion, given that so many brand owners are facing the challenges of the new GTLD environment. And I'm move with Mark Monitor, and I'll be setting the stage for today's event. Before we introduce our speakers, I'd like to run through just a few housekeeping items. In today's presentation, the lines are muted, and this is simply to ensure that there isn't any background noise or interference. If you are experiencing technical difficulties joining the session, file WebEx technical support directly at 1-866-229-3239. I encourage you to ask questions at any time during the event, and questions will be addressed during the Q&A session following the presentation. To set a question, Click the Q-Tab located on the floating toolbar on your screen, and that will open up the box where you can type your question in the space and hit Send. Be to send all questions through the Q&A tab, as this will help with streamlining all questions. Now, if there's a particular speaker that you'd like to answer a question, please be sure to indicate it at that time. Questions that our speakers don't have time to get to, we'll be sure to follow up with you after today's event. We are recording today's webinar, and over the next couple of days, we plan to send out a follow-up email to all registrants with a link to the recording and presentation slides. You can actually receive the email over the next couple of days. So we have a fantastic program lined up for today, and I'd like to go ahead and introduce our first speaker, Beth Allegretti. Beth is President of Intellectual Property at Fox Entertainment Group, based in Los Angeles. She manages the domain name and trademark registration group which registers the domains and trademarks for all of the Fox entities worldwide. She's responsible for managing the company's new DOCS registry and overseeing the registration of domains in this 100 plus new TDLD extension. We're all joined by our resident expert, resident new GTL expert, Elisa Cooper, who's covering some of those frequently asked questions surrounding new GTLDs. Elisa is the Senior Director of Product Marketing of Domain Management for Mark Monitor, and with over 10 years of direct experience, she's an expert in the field of online brand protection and domain management. She's worked with many Fortune 1000 companies in assisting with domain and brand protection policy development. She's been and written extensively on topics and an active member of ICANN's business constituency, the National Anti-Counterfeiting Coalition, and the Online Trust Alliance. So with, I'll go ahead and turn things over to Lisa to get us started. Thanks so much, Ren, and special thanks to Beth Algretti for presenting today. I am very excited about hearing directly from Beth Allegretti from Fox Entertainment to rehear about what their strategies are for GTLDs. But before we jump into from Beth. I want to go ahead and sort of just give an update of where we're at with the new GTLD program. This has been going on now for almost six years. I can hardly believe that we finally made it to this point. New GTLDs are definitely here, and as you all likely know, they're coming at us pretty fast and pretty furious. And what we're going to be seeing out over the next two years. As you may know, there are about 1,350 or so unique TLDs which will be launching over the next two years. It's important to keep in mind that well over half of those are resort of dot brand or single registrant TLDs, meaning the general public will not have the ability to submit for registration. What that does mean is that there will be around 620 or so registries launching where companies will have to make decisions about whether or not they want to apply or they want to block or police. And this is all going to be coming at us over the next two years. All we're seeing up to 20, even up to 40 registries launching per month, which is a tremendous amount given that in a typical year, we only see liberalizations of about 20 or 40 for the whole entire year. Now we're seeing activity that to see in a single year occurring every single month. And there's much to keep and track and maintain in terms of 
what costs are, what the eligibility requirements are, what the terms allowed are. So it's a tremendous amount of information that companies are being forced to synthesize and make decisions about. A very kind of six different categories of TLDs and sort of group them together as either ones that are extremely generic or sites or what consider the vice sites. There's also a group that we have coined as the corporate identifiers. There's a set that are sort of these charitable TLDs and there's the geographic TLDs. And we'll take a look at what we call the six super six in just a moment so you get a better idea of what kinds of TLDs would fall into each one of these categories. But in the big decisions that companies are going to have to make is one, are you going to apply for a registration and are you going to do it in the sunrise period? Two, are you to potentially block, assuming that you've submitted to the trademark clearinghouse and blocking is in an option, or are you just going to police and take action when you find something particularly egregious? Again, it's a tremendous amount of work, and so I'm really excited to hear from Beth about their approach and how they're sort of taking on this whole new landscape. But before we hear from her, I want to go over just review what we're calling our six super six. Start off with a category of TLDs, which we just consider to be the most generic and, and ones that really all companies should be considering look at their how marks or their company names for registration. And you can see that within that list of six, um, there is one that is italicized, and that's dot .home. And at the point, it looks like dot .home will never be delegated because it presents some security risk due to the fact that a particular extension has been used internally for internal resources like internet over you know, the last 10 years and, and even more. And so it's likely that that will never be delegated. And the same is true for dot .court below. Aside from that, these others we consider to be ones that are just so generic. We think all companies should consider those. We have the gripe sites that we think all companies need to be taking a very close look at. And of all the TLDs, I am actually most concerned by gripe sites because I think that once a company chooses to pass on a registration and somebody else registers perhaps a brand name, not the brand owner, but individual registers a brand name and start putting up content really merely uh, describing their experience or a review of the product or service that it will be very difficult to reclaim either through the uniform rapid suspension or through the UDRP because content that's posted on sites may look to be sort of freedom of speech and would fall under sort of First Amendment rights and it would be very difficult to prove bad faith because the restaurant may claim that they are just sharing their thoughts and experiences about a product. So this is one group in particular I think companies need to consider, again, doing just core registrations, ones that are um, already, you know, really sought after and, and ones that where you're already seeing these kinds of uh, right site registrations occurring in today's namespace. Then we have the vice sites, and for some companies in particular who are marketing children and to families, they don't want to see their brands appearing alongside these kinds of TLDs. The, the corporate identifiers, now it may be the case that you've got to prove that you're in an incorporated company or that you are licensed to do business in a particular geography in order to qualify for one of these, but it turns out that it's very easy to get one of these. I think there's a, there, there's a real appearance of these being very legitimate. So again, this is a set I have some concern over. The TLDs, same thing. It may, it may be that you have to prove that you are, in fact, a 501c3 and that you cannot get one of these unless you are a licensed uh, foundation. But it's not the case that basically anyone can get these. Again, I do have concerns of them. And then finally, there are the geographical TLDs. And for some companies, these won't make a lot of sense to have for registrations. But for other companies, particularly those with brick and mortar stores in these particular cities or regions, again, this is another set to take into consideration. Again, it's a huge amount of information and a lot of decisions to be made, which is why I'm so excited to have Beth. And at this point, I want to turn it over to Beth so she can really share with us her practices and her approach to this whole new burning landscape. Beth? Oh. 
So for Fox Entertainment Group, which is part of uh, 21st Century Fox, which was formerly called News Corporation, we produce and distribute feature films, such as Oscar-nominated 12 Years a Slave, um, television series such as The Simpsons and Family Guy, domestic and international television channels, on digital content, apps, and many other forms of entertainment. Our domain portfolio is quite large. Um, it's a 40-60 split between CCTLDs and GTLDs. It used to be mostly GTLDs, but with the expansion of our international businesses, the split is shifting. IO Domains team, which consists of a dedicated domain name administrator and a newly added director of domain name compliance and policy who will be managing our new .fox registry. The registers domains for all of the Fox businesses worldwide and handles domain acquisitions and enforcement. Typically, we register domains in connection with our corporate uses, our TV channels, uh, theatrical film marketing. Um, we also register domains used within films and TV shows as part of the script. Um, we had a solid strategy in place. The domain area was very manageable, and the new GTLDs arrived. early on that this new domain landscape was going to be a challenge. To address, we became educated very quickly about the new GTLDs. We am involved in ICANN so that we can participate in shaping policy related to the new spaces. We participate in several ICANN constituencies and we attend the ICANN meetings. ICANN provides an online section of its site devoted to the new GTLDs where we found information about the, the new spaces. We've all got Mark Monitor for information about the new GTLDs. Um, information about release dates and requirements can be found in the Mark Monitor portal under the new GTLD Info Center tab, and we use that resource often. And we've also talked to many brand owners to see how they're managing the new GTLDs, and we have a range of approaches. Some have provided the list of new spaces to their business units. It just said, let us know what you want to register with no limits or restrictions. Um, we've talked to some that haven't even begun the conversation internally about the new spaces. We found most are approaching this as we are, trying to develop a strategy that allows us to manage risk in the new spaces and to control costs. Our big concern, at least initially, has been protecting our intellectual property. At this point, we put more emphasis on being defensive in the new spaces, but also considering our opportunities. So our plan has been to develop a strategy that would put protections in place as the new spaces launch, but also making sure we're registering domains that might interest down the road. So how to develop our strategy? We did by prioritizing our marks in the context of the new spaces. This was actually the most difficult part of the process, but it's an important step that I strongly recommend. We have core marks that we would likely register or block in many spaces. These are marks that we would not be comfortable if a third party registered. This includes our corporate marks, such as FOX or 21CF, which is um, the for our new corporate name. Our TV channels, such as Fox Sports, our film TV franchises, particularly those around which we have developed sequels or merchandising programs. This here included marks that we would consider registering in spaces that are closely related to our business. For example, we register domains related to our television series MasterChef in spaces such as Dot Kitchen or Dot Academy or we register domains related to our international TV channels in local language extension. These are for which registration would be more targeted. And the third tier consists of those marks that register in specific spaces for specific uses. Some of our marks that are in Chinese or Cyrillic characters that we register only in the corresponding local language spaces. So all of the 600 plus open spaces and which of our key marks 
would be registered in which spaces. We analyzed eNew TLD and looked at how the space relates to our business and our overall enforcement strategies and made determinations about where we would likely register domains, where block, and where we're going to police in the new environment. With some spaces, it felt more manageable to lay a foundation at the start for where to register, even in spaces that won't launch for several years. That way, we were able to keep the big picture in mind while able to make quick decisions about each space as they launch. The key here is to build a framework that's flexible. In fact, our strategy has already changed over the past few months. We've learned more about the new spaces. This also allows us to get a better um, picture of our overall registration budget. We had our framework in place. We registered in the trademark clearinghouse all marks that we plan on registering in the new spaces. Even if it's not a core mark and we will only register in one space. We need to be eligible for sunrise periods and to take advantage of the trademark claim service. If you're not familiar with this, the sunrise period is the time during which owners of valid trademarks have priority to register in spaces. Registering during the sunrise period ensures that you as the trademark owner are able to register your domain before registration opens to the general public. The Mark Claim Service follows the sunrise and is a period during which a potential domain registrant gets a warning notice when attempting to register a domain name that matches a trademarked term in the trademark clearinghouse. If you're receiving and accepting this warning notice, the applicant continues to register the domain name the trademark holder with a corresponding mark in the clearinghouse receives a notification of the domain name registration, so they take any appropriate action if they wish. So, if a party registers a domain containing your trademark term, you should receive a notice by the clearinghouse. However, there's an issue with this service, and these claims notices are not yet being sent to trademark owners. If you haven't already submitted your marks to the trademark greenhouse, it's a good idea to do it now. Value your marks puts you in a position to take advantage of the sunrise period. It takes a while for the trademark clearinghouse to validate marks. Um, we submitted very clean, accurate information about our trademarks, and we still experienced holdups in validating our data. So a time for the process to be completed. You can store your marks in the trademark clearinghouse for one year, three year, or five year terms. We decided to do three year registrations. We one year was too short that so many spaces would not launch within that year, and um, we didn't want to have to go through this process again in another year. And we just felt five years was too long because we didn't know what this new world was going to be like in five years. When looking into the new GTLDs, our first reaction was to register our key marks in every space. Then, you know, once the registries released registration costs and we put the numbers to that, we realized that would not be feasible. Um, so we looked at all 620 or so new spaces. We did look at them by release date to see which spaces we needed to deal with first. Instead, we looked at the universe, each spaces that had not been approved or may only launch several years from now. We broke this down by category, so we identify those categories that relate to our business, um, including spaces that have to do with entertainment, sports, online, et cetera. Then within each category, we identify individual extensions that relate to our business, such as dot .movies for our theatrical group. We identified sports terms, for example, that would be appropriate for Fox Sports and our other sports channels. We identified extensions that relate to our international businesses, such as Dot Uno, uh, being marketed to Spanish speakers. We identified mark space combinations that would be obvious picks by cyber scores, uh, including taking a look at those spaces on Mark Monitor's six super sick list. Several registries offer blocking, 
can be a cost-effective alternative to registration. The largest blocking provider at this point is Donuts, an internet domain registry that applies more than 300 GTLDs, of which ICANN has approved about 200. Donuts offers what they call the Domains Protected Mark List, or DPML, which, according to Donuts, protects trademark holders against cyber squatting. Per validated trademark, trademark holders can block third party registrations across all 200 donut spaces. This is meant to prevent cyber squatters or others with no real interest in the term from registering a domain that contains that term. In theory, this sounds reasonable, um, but what we found is that the block doesn't necessarily mean that each space is locked down for your marks. This was locked to us. One is the blocks. The third parties with validated trademark rights can register what's called an override, which removes your block and allows registration of the third party domain in that particular space. For example, if it has a trademark for the term fox, in with plumbing services, validated trademark, it's fine. And validated that mark in the trademark clearinghouse. Be able to override our block in the dot plumbing space and register fox dot plumbing. There are so domains, which are determined at the discretion of the registries. We're not sure how this is determined, and it appears to be sort of a rolling determination. We don't go up front all the domains, for instance, in donut spaces that are considered premium. Um, cost more to register and registered by any third party in the open registration period, even if they do not have dated trademark rights. So a premium domain is wide open. What that even if you place a block, you may pay to override your own block in order to ensure that another do party does not register your term in that space. And if any of your domains are considered premium, you may also need to register these in the sunrise phase before they're released to the general public. A block is a block until it's not. Make sure that third parties do not register domains containing your trademark. You identify spaces where you will file an override of your own block and be aware of which of your marks are considered premium. Also, that the block does not Retroactively rescind third-party registrations already made in the space. For if a space opened on January 1st, but you only placed your block on February 1st, names that contain your trademark that have already been registered by third parties won't be removed because of your block. So the earlier you place your block, the better. Be not possible to be completely defensive in this new landscape, we're shifting some of our energy from registration to policing for abuse. Um, we've reevaluated our watch services to ensure that we're watching all marks that we've submitted in the trademark clearinghouse. Working with Mark Monitor to ensure that we're alerted to third-party overrides, and hope to be receiving the trademark clearinghouse claims notices soon. It becomes what to do with these notices. Right now we're working on developing a process to track and evaluate the information. We need to put a process in place to monitor how these third-party domains are being used. We can take action against infringers, including utilizing um, the rights protection mechanisms if needed. Of the new GTLDs and the potential for adding many new domain registrations your portfolio. This is a good time to visit your domain management policies. Make sure that your businesses are clear about your registration procedures, about who is authorized to request registrations, and what the process is for doing so. We found it particularly important to reinforce our central domain management role within the company. We want to make it easy for our businesses to know where they can go for information, to learn about the new spaces, and then we can can work with them to develop registration programs and budgets. We um, we want to avoid having them going off on their own and registering um, and investigating all these new spaces. So we re 
are to get the word out that this is the place to come when you need or are interested in one of these new TLDs. It's a good time to look at your current portfolio. Um, if you're considering registering in these new spaces, you could be adding quite a few new registrations to your portfolio. So it's advisable to see if you can pare down existing portfolio um, by identifying domains that you no longer need, domains you're not using, or that just don't make sense anymore, so those that are um, to maintain, but you feel that the risk of cyber squatting in connection with that domain is low. I know that you know, we all tend to sort of get some dead weight in our portfolio, and this is sort of the catalyst to just sort of stop and take a good look at what you've got because you know you're going to be adding a lot more to it. Um, as we've mentioned, we applied for our own TLD.fox. In the evolving landscape, we're, we're just weren't sure about how we will deliver our entertainment services in the future. And if the change is significant, we wanted to make sure that we're part of it. We want our business units every opportunity to be part of this evolving digital world. So we went through the whole long process of applying. We've been um, we've passed our initial evaluation and starting to explore our options with Dot Fox. Whether our businesses take advantage of this or not remains to be seen. But we just felt we needed to um, to get this so that we were in position to um, evolve as this landscape evolves. We've also joined the Brand Registry Group, or BRG. Um, as Elise mentioned, about a third of all new TLD applications were submitted by brand owners for a string that matches their brand or product or service. The BRG is an independent organization of some of these brands, and the BRG represents the common interests of these owners with respect to ICANN, with um, governments and internet users. The key to success in this new world, be educated and about the new GTLDs. Can't overwhelming. What I found was once I really dug in and saw what this was, what these spaces were, um, just made it much easier to put framework in place. Um, take advantage of all the resources offered by ICANN, by the, the individual registries. I go on to the registry sites and see what their requirements, just see how marketing themselves. That helps shape our strategy. Um, take advantage of Mark Monitor's resources. The more you know, the better you will be able to develop your strategy and to guide your business units in developing registration programs. This framework in place, prioritize your marks, and make determinations about where you want to register new domains, where marks you want to block, and have an enforcement strategy in place. It's hard to make these decisions up front, and believe me, I spent hours you know, working on this chart to just really figure out where we needed to be defensively or you know, we might want to use it, but it really pays off. It's challenging, but it will help you manage your registrations and, more importantly, control costs. And once you've put all this effort into developing this framework, be prepared for it to change, because it will in this constantly evolving new GTLD world. And with that, I will turn this back to Elisa. Well, thank you, Beth, and thank you so much for sharing all of that information. I bet everyone was able to really take advantage of your experiences and is able to use that information, at least as a baseline, to help guide where they're going. Let me open it up for Q&A. I wanted to take this opportunity to sort of answer sort of these very frequent asked questions that I keep hearing from our clients. And you know, we've met with well over 100 of our clients to go through what their strategy will be. And there are a few questions that keep coming up on every single conversation that I'm having. And the first question I'm often hearing is, well, what should I submit to the trademark clearinghouse? Now I realize that 
probably most of you on the phone have already submitted to the clearinghouse, but there may be some who haven't. And actually a pretty easy question for me to answer, which is which I once in a while because most of the other questions are very difficult too. When it comes to submitting to the clearinghouse, the question should really be, what do you plan to submit for registration during the sunrise or what would you like to block where blocking is available? That's really the question to ask because you must have a validated trademark in the clearinghouse in order to participate either with a sunrise registration or purchase blocking from Dennis or the right side registry group. Now, an added benefit, and lately this benefit has actually gotten a little bit better, and that additional benefit is that if somebody else registers an exact match of your trademark as a domain name, you receive a notification that the registration has occurred. Now, it used to be that you would only receive this notification if registration occurred during the first 90 days of the general availability period. Well, Deloitte, who is the operator of the trademark clearinghouse, decided that they really wanted to encourage submissions and they wanted to show additional value. And so the way that they were able to show that additional value was to extend the period indefinitely for indication of exact match registrations. What you have to keep in mind here, and it's a great, it's a great added benefit. What you have to keep in mind, however, is the issues that we see in terms of cyber squatting are not really in the exact match, right? They're in all the variations, all the typo squats, all the misspellings. And so, from that perspective, you will not receive notifications from the clearinghouse. But an exact match, you definitely will. Now, always important to remember that the clearinghouse in and of itself does not prevent registration. It does, block and it does not block registrations. It really doesn't do anything. What it does is it gives you that ability to participate in the sunrise or purchase blocking. It also provides a notice to the potential restaurant if they submit for registration during 90 days. The potential registrant will get a notification that what they're about to register matches rights that exist in the clearinghouse, but it does not keep them from completing the registration. It's a pretty easy question to answer. Again, if you want to have a sunrise registration or you want to block, you're going to have to submit to the clearinghouse. Now, a much more difficult question to answer and Beverly touched on this, is why submit for blocking. And we've got really two different blocking offerings right now. We've got the Donuts Group and Right Side Registry. So Donuts, you know, in terms of value, you've got a lot of value there. And I think for, for many companies, submit for blocks will make a ton of sense because it really is going to allow own registered trademark owners to either um, submit to the sunrise or to override a block, and it will keep the cyber squatters from being able to register something that has been blocked. But what I just said is very important. If there is another legitimate owner of a trademark who has submitted that trademark to the clearinghouse, and they can show that they also have rights to the mark, even if you've submitted it for the block, they can always come in and override the block. Blocking is not meant to keep out um, or give rights to trademark owner or another trademark owner. What it's really meant to do is to keep side squatters, individuals who do not have trademark interests, from being able to register something. So there's been a lot of, I think, question, and there's been a fair amount of misunderstanding in terms of what kinds of blocks can be purchased. So you can submit a block that's an exact match to something that's been submitted to the clearinghouse. So first example, if the trademark is Hallmark, you can block Hallmark. But also submit for a block that contains a match of the trademark. So for instance, if X is the trademark and X is appearing in the string, even if my in front and card behind, that would be considered as a block could be applied for. You will have to pay for each and every block that you submit. So because it's eligible for blocking doesn't mean that you automatically get the block from my next card. You need to apply for the block and additional fees 
is a, will actually result. Now, a third example where we've got IBM services and I replaced with a number one would not be available for blocking because it is not an exact match. Of trademark. It is not something, it is not a string containing an exact match. In the case of services with a one appearing where the I should be, obviously um, it is not, it's not a match to the actual trademark. So that would not be available. As Beth alluded to earlier, um, there are a number of exclusions. So even if you purchase a block, not override something that's already been registered. So, for instance, if somebody's already squatting on your brand and then you apply for a block, it does nothing to resolve that issue with that squatted domain. If your brand is generic in nature, if it is a surname or even a first name, it may start showing up on these premium domain lists. So, a very generic brand, and you, you know, also a trademark in which you have rights. If it's up on one of these premium lists, these premium lists are all specific to each TLD that Donuts is offering. If it's on a premium list, that will not be covered by the blocking. And also know that there is a character limit. So your block must at least, if your trademark is one or two characters, you will not be able to apply for a block. If it is three characters, you'll be able to apply for a block, but you won't be able to take advantage of blocking something where there are characters appearing before or after. You'd only be able to do an exact match if a trademark is three characters long. So to be aware of all of these different exclusions uh, when you're making these decisions, and you have to be very aware of who else may have trademark rights um, and has submitted to the clearinghouse and would also be eligible to override your block. So there's quite a bit of uh, different things. But if you've got a unique mark and you know that there aren't any other truck owners in different classes at, you know, from different companies, the blocking can make a lot of sense financially. Another question that I'm starting here, and this is really the big one, are we really seeing registrations? Are people actually registering in these GTLD registries, and are we seeing any cyber squatting? And the answer to both is yes. We are absolutely starting to see registrations in many of the donuts registries. So far, the two most popular registries are .guru, which is closing in on around 40,000 registrations, and .photography, that's well into the 20,000 plus registration realm. We're at about 150,000 new registrations for TLDs. Have to keep in mind also that these are the registries that are now out in the general availability period have a tremendous number of registries that are actually in the sunrise period right now. And so we won't see massive numbers of registrations in those until they move into the general availability period. Seen cyber squatting? Yes, we are seeing cyber squatting, particularly in well known consumer brands. We've seen that the URS has been utilized to recover a couple of domains for a well known technology company. And I think that we can expect that we'll be seeing more abuse, frankly. Um, we'll have to see how the namespaces continue to grow, but, but from what I can see today, it looks like there definitely um, is interest and there are registrations and some of these TLDs are actually starting to take off a little bit. So big final question that I'm hearing is, well, how can I police? What should I be doing? In terms of police, you know, if you do take advantage of the trademark clearinghouse, you will be able to at least know about exact match registrations. Now, one good about new GTLDs is that because they are under the purview of ICANN, new GTLD registry must make available the list of registrations that have been made in each new GTLD registry, which means that policing for abuse, looking for the, the, the typos, the variations, the misspellings, the combinations of the brand, the 
type can all occur because we can get at the list of registrations and we can identify that and report on that. The big question becomes, well, do you do something every time you identify abuse? And we're at a point where it's very important to understand exactly what is going on with the domain before you make that decision or to understand who it is that completed registration um, and to really understand well, what might they do with it before you make that ultimate decision to move forward with a cease and desist or a demand letter or a URS or a UDRP. And you know, I think that's going to become increasingly more important as we start seeing more abuse as opposed to just taking action immediately. Of course, it depends on your brand. Of course, it depends on who submitted the registration. I mean, there are many factors to take into consideration. That is, you definitely want to be familiar with all of the rights protection mechanisms that you have available. And we have a whole variety that are now possible in the new GTLB landscape. So we've got, as I just mentioned, the URS, which is the Uniform Rapid Suspension. It's meant to be a cost-effective way of sending clearly infringing domains. It's an it's a inexpensive a fee to do the filing. It's arbitration through National Arbitration Forum. It, the complaint itself can really be no more than 500 words. It's, very, it's supposed to be very cut and dry. and supposed to be much faster than the UDRP. The UDRP still applies, so we still have access to that. But on top of that, there are three other policies that actually directed at the registry. So the registry is systematically encouraging abusive registrations or the registry is not complying with their uh, contractual obligations with him, there are some other policies in place and ways to go after the registries um, to get them to stop uh, encouraging or participating in certain behaviors. And if you've always got other means of sort of um, cease and desist or if something particularly egregious is going on, um, a takedown via um, the ISP. I think we already have a ton of questions in the queue. I do want to go ahead and open up for Q&A. We've got a good 15 minutes, and we'll try to get through just as many questions as we can. So let me take a look at what we have lined up in the queue, and we'll get started. The first question is, um, I think it's for Beth, how long did you and your team spend working on your new GTLD registration strategy? Actually, we've been working on this for about six months. Um, we we developed our strategy, then we had to get the, the trademarks in the clearinghouse, and we had to put our blocks in place. But it's been about it's been about six months of active um, work on this. Let's see. We have another one for you, Beth, and that is, um, what value, if any, do you gain by participating at ICANN? Um, it'd be, you know, ICANN's sort of a, a crazy place, and it helps to be part of it and kind of understand the crazy. Um, <laughs> it, you, and, and really, it's there... See, you know, we want to know what's going on, and we want to help it. Uh, so, so, I think it's been helpful. And is a lot of work, but I think it's a valuable place to be. Well, there is a question, and it is: How can outside counsel register marks in the trademark clearinghouse as an agent of the trademark owner without setting up a prepaid account funded with fifteen thousand dollars? So if you want to be an agent of the trademark owner, um, there's a way around that prepaid account. However, I do um, that if you are looking to submit, you know, a, a few number of marks to the clearinghouse for your clients, that Thompson Copy Mark is offering trademark clearinghouse submissions. If you have um, quite a few to submit, Mark Monitor can also provide that service. And obviously, um, you know, to uh, get set up with any sort of prepaid, prefunded account. A question, which is, are any other registries besides Donut and Right Side offering blocking? 
knowledge at this point, we are not aware of any others who are offering it. But as soon as we are notified, we let our clients know immediately. So um, we'll send out an alert to clients if there's um, any other portfolio applicants who are intending to provide. But I don't know of any others at this time. A question for you, Beth, um, and this is kind of a tough one. Um, given you've invested in your own TLD, what do you see happening to your existing portfolio? We do not know. And that's a really great question because we we don't. And the thing about the entertainment industry, is, you know, it's a, it's a fast moving business, and our marketing people are, you know, they've got their finger on the pulse of the consumer. And I think it's be the environment and the consumer that's going to let us know what's working for them. So no, I don't know if. The brands are going to take, or if there's certain dot brands that are going to work, you certainly hope that if um, people are moving away from dot coms and CCTLDs, that that, that are dot fox, something that's meaningful to our consumers. But we actually, we really don't know at this point. No one for you, Beth, and and it's three days. But where the new your process sort of fit into your policing strategy, or have you not much thought yet? We're, we haven't used it yet. We haven't um, had an opportunity to use it. So if it if it comes up and it looks like it's going to be effective, we will. Um, Elisa, use the domain back, right? You just, it's just suspended. That's that, right. That, and that, that, yeah. You know, if it's, if it's a domain that we to have that might not be the end for us, maybe we'll do a UDRP. But if it's something we just want to take down, um, yeah, I can see us using it. Yeah, actually, and I actually see um, a fun question that I can which is, you know, what happens to the domain if you win a URS? And as Beth, we were just speaking about, the name is, a, in effect, it's suspended. Let me tell you what doesn't happen to the domain. Who is information remains the same. All the name servers are updated. So whoever the infringer is, his name will still continue to appear on the who is or her name. The domain will continue to be registered. The registrar who initially completed the infringing registration. You will not be able to transfer the name. Essentially what will happen is at the end of the term, then will expire, and now do have the ability to add on an additional term at the registrar where it is registered, but then start working with a new registrar most likely. The name will expire and we become available again for registration. I think some kids are thinking, well, they'll snap it up, but of course, that's not a guarantee that you'll be the one to snap it up. So there are a number of downsides, but I agree. If you're looking for some kind of immediate gratification and you really just want something not pointing to particular content and you don't mind it pointing to a site that says this vein has been suspended, you don't mind that the who is information continues to reflect the infringer name, then, you know, the you might, would be a, you know, option if you just want to make sure that sites know you're resolving to some infringing content. Let's sing along here. So, here's an about when will the notification system be working with the trademark clearinghouse? What is the delay? So, this one, I think. And I'll just say that there have been some glitches. Um, it's a little unclear um, as to exactly where they are occurring. Parties involved are aware that there have been some problems in getting the notifications sent to the agents. You can receive the notification from your agent, or if you did it directly, you would be receiving the notifications directly. So something they're working on, and I would assume that it should be resolved um, fairly shortly.
but here's a kind of a tough question. How will you be monitoring domains that you find trademark clearinghouse notification to see if they are worth pursuing, either through a UDRP or a URS? That is the process we're developing now. Um, we, at this point, we're just going to have to look at each individually. Right now, the volume's not, not so great. I need to put something in place because I have a feeling it's going to pick up. And we're going to need to um, see these things, see what's happening. We have an enforcement team here, so we're working with them to um, the best way to do this uh, that is manageable and cost effective. The question I think I can answer. So, the, where can you find lists of the new GTLDs that have been created? So there's a bunch of different places that you can find lists. So if you want to see a list of everything that had been applied for, you can find that on ICANN's website. If you want to see a list of what is in size, you can find that at the Trademark Clearinghouse website, which is trademark-clearinghouse.com. The sort of more detail, and you want cost, and you want dates, and you want um, these to be categorized, and you want to be able to set up lists. Um, the Mark Monitor Portal, as Beth had mentioned, we have what we are calling our new GTLD Information Center, where you can get very detailed information about what the eligibility requirements are, what the dates are, what the TLD stands for. So there are a variety of different places. Some of them are publicly accessible, like the ICANN website and the Trademark Clearinghouse website, um, and then the new GTLD Information Center is, is for monitor clients. Let's see, just kind of pull through the questions here. Question, um, how do we view the list of registrations for new GTLD? So as I mentioned, it's a requirement that every registry make available the list of their rations for TLD. Those are referred to as zone files. They are essentially lists of domains that have been registered. So in terms of getting access um, to that information, the best way is really probably if you're looking to be tracking and monitor sort of what has been registration, there are a variety of companies that offer domain watching type services. Um, if you're looking for the appearance of a particular mark or brand or slogan or whatever, using one of those services um, would be my recommendation as a way to understand what's being registered. And because and, you know, new TLDs are under the purview of ICANN, we're able to get access to that information. And yeah, there are a variety of companies that offer those kind of services including Mark Monitor. So, um, another question, I think this goes back to the fact that um, there are some glitches in terms of, of notifications not necessarily being sent by clearing health in terms of uh, registrations occurring for matches. Uh, the question is, we mark in the clearinghouse and just learn that a third party secured it in .guru, or not no, but they were not notified. And is the system working? Shouldn't we have notified in advance? You should have been notified after the registration occurred. Um, I mean, that's an exact match registration to the mark in the clearinghouse. And again, there there appear to be some there are some glitches, but I know that the parties involved are working. Um, it, it's who I believe between somewhere occurring between the trademark clearing house and registries themselves. Let's see, I think we have a couple more minutes, and let me see if I can see if there are any other questions. Quite a few in here. So, do you need to start with a U.S. trademark registration to submit within the clearing house? And that's an easy question. Um, the answer is no. It just needs to be um, a trademark that's of uh, national. Um, Alicia? Yes. 
one of the things is to be eligible for the um, client notice, you need to submit ends of use of your mark. Yeah. It can be used anywhere, and it's it's not like a hugely strict requirement, but a mark that's currently not in use, to get those notices. You can still rare, but you you get the notices. So just be aware of that. We have a couple marks that we we using and um we're able to get the notices. Yeah, in order to participate in the sunrise you have to show the proof of use. Yeah, sunrise. And thank you for that excellent point. Totally for mention that. Uh, here's a question, and I'll I'll just speak. I be best if you can give your thoughts on this one. Um, in terms of like what your perspective is, um, do you know yet to what extent legitimate businesses and brand owners are registering GTLDs for actual commercial use, or are most of the registrations defensive? And I yes. I'm talking to other companies is at that point it's mostly defensive. Um, they sure somebody else isn't getting the main. So I that's mostly what I've heard. Yeah, I would I would um fully concur with that. I think definitely companies are for most trying to protect themselves. I'm thinking about what could they possibly want to use in the future, but right now it's really about where I need to protect myself because there are so many wide open namespaces and they're coming at us uh, and furious. Um, I'm just continuing to look here. We have just a minute or so. Um, A question about blocking. If someone infringes on your brand and then you file for a block, will the block retroactively apply to that domain once the term of the registration expires? And question, and I believe I, I will actually need to, to double check because I actually am not sure, but I believe the block would apply after the domain has expired. But I will actually need to get back to the person who asked this question, because I'm actually not completely sure, but I believe that is the case. Uh, another question, if our block is overwritten, is final, or can we override the override? <laughs> we actually we had a number of uh, discussions with us uh, expressing our concern over this. We asked that there be a first right of refusal for you know, the brand owner that had submitted the block so that they could, you know, go ahead and make the registration um, and ask for that repeatedly, but that was not something that they were willing to do. So to answer that question, no, it's pretty much final. So once the book has been overridden and it's been registered by someone else, you certainly have the ability to pursue URS or UDRP, but in terms of trying to arbitrate like with the registry or get them to do something, they're willing to do anything at this point. And the, the entity that has placed the block, we're notified of an override, correct? That's correct. That is correct. That is correct. I'll see if I can get one more question in, and let's see if we can get... Um, See, there's there's so many guns. Um, let's see, for the last one, let's take. Um, is there any time limit to file a URS after receiving a notice, or can we file at any time? Uh, yes, there is no limit on time. You can file it just like a UDRP. You can file it at any time. And in fact, you know, it may be the case that, that you you know. You're a aware of something that is infringing, but they're not doing anything in particular with the domain. Um, and, you know, in two years' time, all of a sudden, there's a page, there's something that's particularly egregious, and then you want to take action. So there is no time 
time um, restrictions in terms of when you have to respond after you've been notified. Well, actually, just at about time, and I know that there were a bunch of other questions, and we'll, we'll do our best to try to get back and answer all the questions that were asked. But I want to take this opportunity to sincerely thank Beth Allegretti from Fox Entertainment for joining us, for sharing all valuable information, and for, for taking the time today. So thank you so much, Beth. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And I want to thank all of you for joining today's call, as always. And, you know, we'll look forward to talking to you again soon. We are headed off to the ICANN meeting in Singapore in just a few weeks. And as always, we will be hosting our post-ICANN recap webinar, so I'll be able to share with you the important events and activities that occurred at the ICANN meeting in Singapore. But again, have a wonderful day, and we'll look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you so much.